around, I'm a drug addict or a drug dealer or a prostitute or a drug addict dealing prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm mentally ill, you know what I'm saying? So it's funny, but she's, she's talking about, she, what she's saying is like the, the value that are placed on white bodies and black bodies. And so the fact that this white woman, one, feels safe enough to like walk around, walk her dog late at night, and if Autumn, who is from the neighborhood, of, you know, can't do that without either being harassed or having these negative connotations or these, these notions of deviance attached to her body and her movement. So I move a lot faster than I planned on. But I have, so there's one other artist I want to talk about, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about her art, but we, she made some really interesting comments, again, regarding the movement of bodies within this, uh, this emerging landscape, of third words, emerging landscape. And also, she made some really poignant points about Emancipation Park and what does it mean when like, $25 million is being put into this park. You know? And uh, for those of you who weren't here earlier, I was kind of reciting a field note of me walking around the park and seeing different things. So, you know, I've seen at least one rap video filmed in Emancipation Park. I know that there's others that have been there. So what does it mean, like, when you put $25 million in the park, is it likely that you're going to be seeing certain things like rap <coughs> videos in the park, homeless folks sleeping in the park, people, like, blasting their music loud in the park? What becomes deviant after, you know, you invest that, that much amount of money within a, a part, and who are you investing that money for as well? Um, so, um, I want to talk about Makina, and I put up this, uh, this picture, uh, so Robert, so Pruitt organized this pop-up sculpture park last month, but I'm not going to talk about the pop-up sculpture park, because uh, I ended up pulling out some other things that Makina said that I felt like were important, and how with this impending change or with city streets how the use of bikes within third war becomes something that is you know uh not for necessity but more so for leisure and it becomes like a hip thing to do and uh i had mentioned to her that the last time i was home i was walking past emancipation park at night and this is before they tore up the tennis court because they tore the tennis court up after last and i had noticed that there were these like you know this thing like, I guess in their 20s, 20 year olds or whatever, playing this like polo game on the tennis court on their bikes. And I was like, damn, like, what is, like, I was like, they're playing bike polo in Emancipation Park on the tennis court at night. And I again, actually, I actually used to play. Right, so it, I it, for like three or four years. And I was like, that's something I've never seen. And like, granted, I hadn't seen many people playing tennis on the tennis court <laughs> in Emancipation Park. But to like night after night to see this collect the collectible people playing this game in this park, you know, it got me thinking about so what does that mean about this space that I don't know, that it's it's fluid enough or it's safe enough so that something like this could begin to transpire. Something that hadn't been happening say a year or so, like a year prior. <clears throat> it was actually in one trust at the Chelsea Market Square for a new emancipation park. What's it called? Like oh, what's the game called? Uh, bike polo. Uh, bike polo. I had it right. <laughs> they call it hardcore. Okay. Yeah, playing tennis courts. I was like, yeah, they like they're playing polo, but on bikes, bike polo. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, and so the last thing I want to kind of mention uh, before I close is something that McKenna mentioned about Emancipation Park, and so I kind of opened with my. I kind of opened with a synopsis, like my, my vision of Emancipation Park, me walking through Emancipation Park, me walking around Emancipation Park. So I kind of want to close in that way as well. And um, what McKenna has to say about Emancipation Park is, um, it's, just, it's really interesting. Because you know the history of Emancipation Park, the history being that Emancipation Park was a, a plot of land that a collective of formerly enslaved black folk in Houston put their money together to purchase so that they could celebrate Juneteenth year after year, <coughs> hence, hence Emancipation Park. So it's like, you know, it's really interesting because you know the history of Emancipation Park. I think when you talk about public spaces and their uses, I think like homelessness and the kind of displacement of people, I think Emancipation Park may have been a spot where, you know, someone could have, someone could find some kind of space there. So someone, so people who didn't have a place of their own could find a space at Emancipation Park. 
So with this changing of it, with the city putting in 25 plus million dollars into the park, I don't understand how that possible, how that possible function will exist in this community the same. Like, will it meet those same kinds of needs for the people that, it, that live there? Um, and for those of you who have not seen the landscape or like the, uh, the architectural drawing of what the Emancipation Park is supposed to look like in the future, this is, uh, this is it. And so this is, this is where we are right here. Uh, Elgin, this is Dallas. So the pool will be there, but there's gonna be like this nice little pavilion in the front and it's, this is supposed to be obviously the sports area, but this is proposed to be some kind of entertainment area, I guess with concerts and whatnot will happen. So you look at the specs of the park and you, it makes me wonder what will no longer be allowed, what, what, what will no longer be sanctioned in this, this, this new space. Uh, so uh, I guess it's kind of, and then there's like this visualize the dream. So like, what dream is that? <laughs> <laughs> but I guess the transition into some kind of discussion, I figured I would end with a question because I don't have the answers. Uh, so how might we emphasize and use black arts to, in order to produce more sustainable black spaces? You know, either in the face of or alongside urban renewal, because it's happening. It's already here, and uh, I think you know. There are other communities around the country that are doing, they're think, doing and thinking the same thing. Like in Detroit, you have all these really dope projects going on in Detroit. Like you have the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network that have taken over uh, a city park. And they have the largest urban agriculture, uh, a lot of the urban farm, the largest urban farm in the country. But at the same time, uh, when I was in Detroit in the spring, Detroit had just got its first grocery store. And that first grocery store was a Whole Foods. And mind you, Detroit is a city, it has a population of 700,000 people. So Detroit in itself is also figuring out a way to, is also in this process of urban renewal. But alongside that, in the face of that, you have people like, uh, you know, D-Town Farm figuring out another way to use these vacant lots. And so I want to think about how in which, how, in what way in which art can be that, that medium through which, you know, spaces are, are reused. That's what I got. Thank you. I think it's a answer your question. About Can you speak up a little bit, bro? Uh, I think to answer your question about um, black arts, uh, I think what's important is that there's participation. I think. Uh, the problem with, say, like Emancipation Park, a park I actually kind of came here and used, I would actually ride with the, uh, the people that ride bike polo. And uh, we, we were, I ro rode there before, like maybe years before uh, while being school here. There was not much use of the space. And I think that when you don't use the space and you don't really have much, you know, uh, open concern about what's happening. You lose the space because I think that, say, with the with the fight culture coming in there, they use the space. It was also interesting to hear, you know, what you're saying and what you know you quoted Autumn you know, as saying about how you know she likes the things that you know come with gentrification. Some of the things, you know, uh, coffee shops, vegan, vegetarian restaurants, nice updated parks, somewhat. You know what I'm saying? But it's like. They're not building it for you. They're not. It's not. You're not in the plan of, you know, who is to come. You know. So I think that's. That's just. That's the Does the new plan involve a bike polo court? <laughs> uh, well, I, I can't I tell if there's still going to be a tent. I mean, I think a bike polo court is wherever you make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from here. I'm from the East Coast. I just moved here five months ago. But Brown um, East Coast. Um, Bridgeport, Connecticut. You made it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. um, but um, what I've noticed, a, a big difference from the East Coast to here is um, more people of color moving to the South and um, being aware of what's going on in their neighborhood compared to the East Coast. I feel like, um, especially growing up in Bridgeport, um, our Mecca was down, uh, for people of color, our Mecca was downtown Bridgeport. And um, within the past five years, it has totally become gentrified. But the, the history of Bridgeport has 
always been, well, in the past, before it was our Mecca, it was just solely for the Europeans that settled in Bridgeport, but then it became ours, and I guess they took it back. But it was a total, like, it, they just pulled the wool over our eyes. And I felt um, the way, the only reason why it happened was because um, uh, the young people of color were moving out, not coming back. So, um, and then the, elder, the older people were just, they didn't know what to do. The ones that have been there from the beginning didn't know what to do, so there wasn't that middle. There wasn't that, the, the voices that we needed to hear, which is 20 and up. Um, and I feel like that you guys have it in Houston, but um, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what's happening. That's Why is letting it happen? So in, in conversations I've had with people, all, all kinds of stuff that came up, I just couldn't fit it all in this talk, but I had some conversations with folks, some people were like, well, you know, some black folks sold their land in the neighborhood. And if you can look at it like, well, black folk gave up their land, or you can look at it, well, some black people, some people sold their land and some people were forced to sell because they couldn't afford to keep it. And then uh, I remember having a conversation with someone and we were just like, you know, you know, I guess there are black folk moving to all these suburbs and buying homes in all these suburbs. Like, man, why aren't there black folk moving to Third Ward? Like, it's popping. I mean, like, you can get a nice house in Third Ward whether it's an older house that you renovate or it's one of these condos, you know, for the same price that you can get like a house out in Sugar Land or whatever, and you save some gas. Um. That's where, like, my question on how does this movement in and out of the neighborhoods and women of bodies. Um, I'm from Chicago, I'm also in but I've noticed the same in the south side of Chicago, right, where the community and the activities of the community are seen as deviant, so as a young person, you're always told, well, get out because you're constrained, because people don't pay attention to your neighborhood, you need to get out, right? Mama toss out in the suburbs, you know, you try to get out, get out, get out. Um, So how does that movement of, you know, the exodus of the neighborhood uh, play? Well, what I wanted to say is, how come this park isn't for us? You know, when do we, begin to value ourselves enough to say that this park is for us, this has been for us, it is for us. There may be other people that come to use it, but this park is for us. The people that, that, that initiated this, um, this renovation of the park, there are black people, friends of, uh, friends of Emancipation Park, the people who are raising the money for it, even though the city is part of it, but they are also black people. So I'm just wondering how we can change the way that we talk about, like we don't deserve it. We don't, like we don't deserve to have a $25 million renovation on a park that's in our neighborhood. I just, I, I, what I would like to see, you know, because I know there are a lot of people saying, it's not for us, it's not for us. Well, who's it for? I, I, I don't live here, I work here. Some people live here. Why, how come this park is not for me? It's not, how come it's not for you that live here? So I don't, I don't, you know, I, I think that this is old language. That we're, we're speaking old language and we have a, we have a responsibility to speak differently about what our lives are like, what our lives are like here for our children so that we can change the way that we talk about they. Who is they? Who is they? They is we. The government, they is we. So how do we, how do we change the way that we talk about it so that we understand that we begin to think that this, I deserve this. My neighborhood deserves this. My people deserve this. There was a quote earlier from Pruitt when he was talking about the Sunday share, and he was talking about dispelling these myths about the vacant lot. And he was like, he said, dispelling this myth for like the community, but also dispelling, he said, dispelling this myth almost like dispelling it for me. You know, so like we also assume like certain, you know, tropes about our neighborhood or about ourselves, you know. And uh, you were mentioning uh, who the neighborhood is for. Like I've had that same question, like, Almost if the if the park if this imp, this park that's coming was for the people who are existing here it would have been done you know years ago like that twenty five million would have been raised and put it 
after that part a long time ago. You know. It's 33 months. Well, yes. Well, the sign says 25, but I read a Houston Chronicle article that said, yeah, it's, of course, 33 months, but who's counting? Go around to the other birth center. So, of course, if I'm the only African American, that means that others are not owned by African Americans. There's something else, and the space is different. Like, but when I and I'm now getting okay, this is what I wanted to say. My space is our space, right? It's our space, and when you go into their space. It's so totally different, but we don't value the space that I have created, and it is all of what we need, and I'm right here in Third Ward, and I have to pay the bills by other people coming in, and so I'm saying that we need to start valuing us, like she said, because we keep looking for somebody else to give us the things that we need, and you want to know how do we sustain ourselves. Well, I don't know of anything more important than to have somebody help you bring your child into the world than somebody who loves you and knows your history and has your same history. And so it is education, but our spaces are different. And a lot of times people think, well, we're, I'm a human being. People say, I'm a human being. And we all are human beings. But the real deal is that we are different and we need to value our differences. And we do deserve all of what it is that we get, but we have to make it. And we have to demand, like, when we move out, and then you're like, well, why does it change? Like, it changes because sometimes we can't afford the taxes, like I'm having problems right now. But um, we also have to demand that the businesses and or we have to use the businesses that are here. Because we don't do it. When I say, uh, I'm talking about African Americans. And we don't. And we don't. Because our, the spaces are different. And I just hope that we can all go out. And, and that's everybody in the room. I don't care if you live here or not. But value what is here and then support it. And if something is weak, say, hey, this is weak. Can you make it a little bit stronger? Or I'll help you make it stronger. Because it's only going to come from within. I hope everybody saw that Sister Soldier um, thing that was on Facebook where Cornell West was on there because it was really deep. And she was a young little girl and she took Cornell West to task about us taking care of us. Us taking care of us. And so I don't blame any, you know, there is history and all that, but we have to start taking care of us. So I wasn't familiar with the birthing center, but I'm happy that it's there. Just like I'm happy that the co-op popped up in the summer. I came home in the summertime, I was like, the co-op, damn. Yeah, that's what's up, finally. <laughs> and they're about to put it in the garden. So I'm happy that these spaces exist. And I think it's just a matter of like, you know, even with the co-op, the co-op started slow. I think the visibility also in like a kind of re-educating ourselves. Because it's not something that's foreign to us as a people. You know, sometimes, you know, we lose aspects of our culture. Uh, North, and I'm sure it, it happened in New York and all other uh, big cities, uh, was that you, you made a, uh, you told us one earlier today, it was a really deep quote, uh, the real, racialization of space and specialization of race. And what I think, and it took me actually, I was like, man, that's a deep, 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 you know, when you think about it, it took me a few minutes to actually realize what she was talking about. But I wanted you to discuss um, the um, nomadic nature of the spatialization of race. Because it seems like when gentrification happens, uh, many cultures, you know, be it African American, you know, uh, Hispanic, whatever, they just take that culture and they move it to, like, you know, we still become um, uh, segregated in different neighborhoods. We just take over different suburbs, different parts of town, and then we take that culture over there. Uh, but as far as, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I uh, recently uh, looked at Third Ward and, um, uh, actually, the uh, the chamber and management district brought, a, and I, I work for a big financial center, and they brought a lot of a lot of the VPs they brought us down to talk about you know investing and, and lending and, 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 and marketing in that area, and the businesses that are going there, a lot of times I don't think that they're marketing to people who are already living there. They're marketing to people outside to make it kind of hip. You know, it's a good investment. Come here, buy here, and your your money will grow. And then I, a lot of times what I see is, the one, what, I, what I'm seeing is the ones who are living there, they're selling out, you know, and 
not selling out like we can sell, but they're selling and they're and they're getting their heyday and they're moving out to the suburbs where they think it's nice, but they they're, they're, they'll be police different, you know, where they're treated differently in the grocery stores. They want something nice, but then I think what happens is the whole culture just becomes dramatic because um, when they move out to the suburbs, you get white flight, you get a lot of other things, and then there, it just all the cultures are just shifting and become dramatic. I want to hear you what your thoughts were on that. I think so. I wasn't expecting you to go to the, to the suburbs, because I think the majority of people that are moved out of neighborhoods when like gentrification starts taking place aren't going to the suburbs. I mean, if they're going to the suburbs, they're going to uh, well, the, the land, largely. The, land, the, the renters aren't. The renters aren't. Right. If you're in Third Ward, mm -hmm. you're going to rent somewhere else, probably not the suburbs. But if you own land there, you're, you're going to sell out, because you're getting, you're getting a payday. You know, I'm seeing it happen. I'm seeing properties. I'm doing a loan right now for several million that, you know, just by it's just because of what's going on in third floor. I mean, know? then Houston is like a, a city of suburbs, too. When you think about Houston in general, I mean, you have Sugar Lane, you have Pear Lane, you have Kingwood, right. Humble, Tascacita, Katy, like, growing up, like, that's what I, I, I grew up in, like, some of those spaces, you know? I grew up on the east side of, I went to North Shore, you know? I think that's part of the culture of Houston too, though. Like you, you move out into the suburbs and you buy a house and you get a little plot of land and whatnot. And I don't think that's you know just common in Houston. I think that's also part of the U.S. in general. Like you know, you're brought up to think that you have to go and buy your own plot of land, specifically or preferably in the suburbs, and not in the city center. Another generation. You know, the first African American millionaire was Mac Hanna, who owned the property right out of Dowling and um, Wheeler. It's two generations gone, that money is gone. And he was the first African American millionaire. The money is gone. I think you should also Third Ward is, is big, though. Like, so I'm. I'm thinking about this particular area, Third Ward, but if you go further down to south to towards McGregor, then like, yeah, you have, you know, black money down that way and they're fairly stationary, they're not being moved around. Um, I wanna to touch on the question that you ended with, how arts can how artists can use, you know, work and space and that kind of thing. I just wanna comment on like the artists in the room and the project that we've been doing, sort of the public space project, the sculpture part, uh, Nate did a project a few years ago uh, called The New News, where he did newspapers, created his own newspaper and put them out in the neighborhood. Uh, <coughs> Jamal did a project, he does a lot of stuff with the sign painting tradition. I think one of the things that we're trying to do, and we're not like working as a collective doing this, but these ideas are all strung together by trying to maybe remember what the neighborhood used to be like, and not, and not in terms of like, well, maybe there's a little bit of nostalgia in it, but it's not totally about nostalgia. It's about like what what was powerful about like the, the continuity of, of community, and then like bringing that definition back. Because one of the things that happens is like, of course, you know, if we had the money, we could just buy the land and do whatever we wanted. But without like a strategy for that, like as artists, we are trying to like maybe remind people that this could be something, used to be something, will be something so that you all are stringing them together, but also that the conversations are not just about the people who are in this room, but the people who are actually, if you're laying, sticking claim to this, will stake claim to everybody else and tell them that this has also been happening. And this conversation cannot continue to be insular. And so who else are we having the conversations with? They're not just the artists, or not just the neighborhood people, but the people who are potentially moving in, the people who are actually doing the lending, so that there is understanding about that history. And I think that there is that aspect of the empowerment of that artist and actually start showing where that history is that needs to be the other component instead of just, and not just having the art, but also what is the conversation around it and so that those conversations actually last over time.